so it's useful from my point of view to be able to talk to people like yourselves about them because um, they're not specifically sometimes directly related to timber. Often there's other issues and we just happen to be putting timber inside of those. So um, yeah, good place to sort of come and talk about some of these ideas. Um, so timber buildings, they seem to be getting more and more prevalent. If you sort of Google, you know, mass timber buildings or timber buildings and look at the images, there's everything from sort of small sort of galleries all the way through the, the high rise, you know, real high rise buildings are sort of 18 storeys and more, and um, they are everywhere. Um, and that's the part which has been kind of interesting in the last sort of 10 years or so, from my point of view, is seeing the growth in timber buildings. Um, I've worked on timber structures sort of all my career. I was lucky to start in with the, in some ways the structural side of timber, then realised that burning timber was kind of more interesting than breaking timber, um, and have continued to, <laughs> to be involved with burning timber in some ways because it is a really interesting topic. Um, I've worked on a lot of smaller buildings, a lot of older historic buildings and turning them into interesting um, buildings, and a lot of boring timber buildings as well. But the last five or six years have suddenly become a really interesting place to be. So it's, from my point of view, it's kind of nice to finally be in, in a place where this sort of stuff is happening all the time. Um, interestingly, um, you know, height-wise at the moment, um, 18 stories in Vancouver, the Brock Commons building was um, the world's tallest timber building for a while, and then it recently was taken over by this. Um, timber building in Norway, which is still 18 storeys but about 20 or 30 metres um, taller, especially with the little timber trellis on the top there. Um, and there seems to be a push for height at the moment, which is interesting from a timber point of view because um, in some ways we're still trying to grapple with a whole lot of things which are not related to height. Um, in some ways they're related to vibrations and durability and um, you know how the most how we use these build, buildings um, efficiently and aspects of sustainability. All these questions which are really important um, but we're still pushing for height, which is kind of nice. Um, this building in Norway, if you want to, you can stay at it. It's called the Wood Hotel, which I thought was fascinating. Um, and so you can stay there. It's, it's about 130, 140 pounds a night um, at the moment. Um, you can just go and stay there, which I thought was kind of interesting to be able to get yourself and immerse yourself in the world's tallest timber building. Because most of these places we see from the outside or we see images, but you can't actually go inside them. So um, great place to, to see. Um, won't stay the tallest for long. Um, this building sort of on the far side there is actually a building in Austria called the Hoho building, um, which is intended to be about 24 storeys. It's a timber concrete hybrid. A lot of these buildings often involve timber um, and concrete. Um, and so that has very close to being topped out. It'll be occupied sometime next year and will take the mantle of being sort of the world's tallest timber building, though there's kind of battles going on as to which is the more sort of purest timber building and those sort of things. But as I said, there's sort of this push for height and I think this will stay in some ways relatively the, the tallest building for a period of time but already there's a number of people talking about 30 story buildings or 32 story buildings and so you know this is from our point of view really interesting because you know we're pushing those boundaries a lot and we're pushing them quite quickly um, and so we want to make sure that we understand what we're doing not just from a structural point of view durability but also more importantly from a high point of view obviously um, and importantly, the, the, the change that we're seeing is the fact that, um, you know, it's not just about sustainability in the way that you want to build your building, the fact that you're using timber rather than concrete or steel, so there's a whole carbon story around that now, and at the moment it's interesting, there's a whole aspect related to um, climate change which is going on and how timber can influence, um, you know, markets with regard to, you know, more timber buildings create um, places for trees to go and that in some ways regenerates forests and the ability to have sustainable forestry is all part of the story which is kind of an interesting aspect which I didn't realise but um, you know there, there is a whole view around the fact that people want to see the timber as well um, and that's an interesting aspect from our point of view from an engineering point of view and fire aspect because we can build a timber building and cover it all up in you know fire aid of sort of gypsum drywall and in some ways it's no different to any other structure but if we suddenly start to expose all the timber and have these sort of beautiful spaces in the summaries, this is what they're being marketed on, is the exposed timber. Um, that changes the way the fire works and the way we kind of think about the fire dynamics in a space like this. And realistically, you know, for, for a number of years, in some of the earliest sort of, you know, taller timber buildings, and some of the taller ones were sort of five or six storeys, you know, sort of even up to 10 years ago, we, we looked at, you know, having a small amount of timber exposed because we knew that there were issues associated with this. We were able to carry out basic analysis to be able to look at what the, um, the exposed area of timber would do to a, you know, to a compartment fire, start to understand that. But we knew that there were limitations as to how much timber we could expose. Um, because the reality is, you know, in some ways, you know, timber is fuel within the space. Um, 
we have an assumption around most building codes and most, about most <coughs> applications and the way we design the buildings that there is a certain amount of fuel which sits in the space. We suddenly introduce a whole lot of fuel, which is the structure, changes the biodynamics in that space. And so, you know, we had the ability to, to understand that and carry out some basic analysis on that. But it's very different having, you know, some of these discrete elements of timber which you can kind of identify in some ways and you can add a small percentage to an overall um, a fuel load and making a whole lot of general assumptions and carry out some sens sensitivity assessment. And we can understand that. But it's different when you're exp you know, basically exposing most of the timber. And I think importantly is that, you know, from an engineering point of view, we can push towards wanting um, to have a lot of the timber exposed, but in some ways we're pushing against the stream because the reality is, is that there's a real, real strong push to have the timber exposed. And what we see is that projects where you can have the timber exposed will probably go ahead and projects where the timber can't be exposed don't go ahead, which is really interesting from a viability point of view. And it's interesting that it's got to that point. Another Best, another really good way to, to see this is this is the Brock Commons building and um, the one in, um, in just out of Vancouver at University of British Columbia. Um, if you Google images of you know of, of search, if you do a Google image search of this, what comes up is lots of images that look like this one in the top corner, showing the timber during construction and showing the the the, um, the timber when you know panels are put in place and people are in there screwing things together and those sort of things. They all look a bit like this, but. You know, what happened during the construction process was that, you know, there was a concrete topping put on the floor, um, all the fire and drywall went on all the columns and on the ceiling to cover up all the timber and all the real ugly stuff that goes into buildings went in, all the, you know, all the pipes and penetrations and cables and air conditioning and all that went in. And then, you know, the final product is this, it's a student dorm, um, most, you know, it's, it's very typical with small rooms, um, you know, it just looks like any other building. Now, the reality is it's very hard to find images of the finished because nobody wants to look at those. <laughs> Everybody wants to look at this. And there are people who think that the building looks like this. That's simply because of the amount of marketing, the amount of images related to this building and the way that it's basically portrayed. Um, and it's a really, really good example of the, of the issues we face, I suppose, from an industry point of view, is that you know, we have developers and clients who want to build buildings. And they want to obviously be able to sell those buildings or be able to lease those buildings because it's to you know, people staying there as, as residential apartments or as an office space and to do so it's got to be marketable and what they find it from a timber point of view there's a nice sustainability story around it but they end up wanting to market the timber they want to market the difference of what it looks like and so we have this push basically from the people who want to build the buildings that they want to be able to see the timber and so that brings in a whole lot of issues for us because the nice easy solution for us is obviously to cover it up from a fire point of view all the issues kind of go away and if we could do that um, you know, in some ways I wouldn't probably be here talking to you about timber buildings and the issues involved because we'd all be just covering it up and there'd be a really good sustainability story because we've used a whole lot of timber and we haven't used a whole lot of carbon in producing concrete and steel and we've produced something which we can potentially reuse even in the future when the building gets demolished. So, you know, it's a very different kind of story. So when it comes to, I suppose, the aspects of how we construct buildings, not just timber buildings, but any buildings, um, there's a separation in the code, and most codes are always like this, in the fact that if we have low and medium rise buildings, they typically have a certain limited amount of fire protection often. It's just more exits, they may have some detection, they may have some sprinklers depending on what the space is. Um, but generally they have a certain limited amount of fire ratings as well, 30 minutes, maybe only 60 minutes depending on the country you're in. Um, and there's generally a reasonable um, statement that's either written into the code or sort of implied in the code that if, if the, if in some ways, if the fire protection doesn't quite work, um, you know, it's acceptable in some ways to lose the building provided all the people have got out and you don't spread fire to any of the neighbouring buildings. So we have, a, in some ways, a societal loss aspect which we accept in the fact that for low and medium rise buildings, you don't want, to, you don't have to, you don't need to actually provide a whole lot of protection to actually protect the structure. It's acceptable given the fact that there's accessibility for fire, um, fighters outside the building. Um, we're the ability for people to get out relatively quickly. Um, not, provided we don't spread fire, we actually can allow a building in some ways to burn down. Um, not great from a media point of view, we don't like that. The reality is that, that occurs and there's an acceptable amount of loss <coughs> of that. For high rise buildings, and most codes sort of have a statement of where a high rise building kicks in. Sometimes it's steps, sometimes there's various heights or certain areas. Sometimes it's pretty much a straight line and below this height you're not high rise, above this height you are. We always have a different criteria. Um, a lot of it's based around the fact that we have to obviously have to achieve life safety, and that's 
often difficult because people take a lot longer to evacuate um, and we have potentially phased evacuation as well so we have to account for that. Um, we may have people staying in place as part of the evacuation process. There's also firefighting intervention that has to occur, and again we're out of the, the height limits so typically it's internal firefighting so there has to be an extra level of fire protection that needs to go in and that occurs with higher fire ratings so typically 90 minutes or 120 minutes depending on the building that's involved. Um, but also there's an expectation of sometimes again this is written in the code and very explicit or it's sometimes written behind the language and you've got to search for it and potentially it's in guidance and those sort of things that if we have a fully developed fire, so potentially our fire protection doesn't quite work, our sprinklers don't work, potentially the firefighters can't get in there and we actually have a fully developed fire which grows and burns and decays, but the structure should be able to resist that fire. So we shouldn't expect collapse. So there's a difference between a, a medium sort of high, low and medium rise building, maybe sort of four, five, six stories, and a high rise building which may be eight or nine or 10 stories or taller in the fact of what that fire protection needs to achieve. And the reason I'm pointing this out is that this here basically is really important because we have all these timber buildings which are potentially medium rise buildings, seven and eight storeys, or they're high rise buildings at nine and 10 storeys. But the difference in what the code expects from them from a performance point of view is very, very different. And that becomes a problem for us because we often see differences obviously in, in this from a global perspective because people say, I wanna build one of those, I wanna build it here. And it's like, well, that code says you can do this, but this code says you can't. Um, but also in the fact that there is a, a significant amount of difference in the way that we treat the buildings when it's low rise and we can uh, allow certain aspects to occur from a fire resistance point of view and this potential that the, the building may actually be able to burn down compared to something where it has to resist the full fire and, and actually you know, re resist the, um, the growing fire and, and decay through the burn out. So um, there's been a lot of fire testing with CLT, a lot of compartment fire testing. Um, and this is a list that which we keep track of, we try and track all of these. Um, I've been lucky enough to be involved in a number of these and have probably seen um, probably as many CLT compartment fire tests as anyone else, um, partly due to my location and partly because you know some of these we've actually paid for ourselves as well. Um, really interesting over the last sort of seven or eight, nine years to see more and more compartment tests going on. Some with small amounts of CLT exposed, some with large areas of CLT exposed, some in relatively small rooms, um, some in very, very large rooms as such. Um, and the, the whole point of these was simply to, to look at what is the influence of exposed CLT on a compartment fire? How does it influence the growth? How does it influence flashover? How does it influence the, the, the period of um, full development? And how does it influence decay? Um, and it's interesting that in some ways, a lot of these tests that are carried out in different locations, often with different criteria, um, typically, most of them are based on low fire loads or more, or, or fairly clearly stated residential fire loads. A lot of them are set up, so they look like small residential buildings as well, studio apartments, residential apartments. They all have a lot of stuff in common, which has been really, really interesting and useful from our point of view that in the end, they actually start to show nice trends which we can use. So, you know, there's been over, when you look at, you know, it's been over 30 compartment tests because a lot of, a lot of these tests they're burning not just one fire, they're having four or five or six fires. So there's multiple fires that we can use in different arrangements. And what it clearly shows is that, you know, the compartment fire is influenced by the exposed timber. Um, there's also influence of obviously by the ventilation involved as well. And there's some nice correlations which we've had for you know, it's almost 30 or 40 years looking at the way that fuel um, ventilation and, um, you know, fire develops as such. Um, the heat release um, definitely increases with the amount of timber that's being exposed. Um, certainly, some researchers have looked primarily at that and tried to link exactly how the heat release um, changes with the amount of timber. Not everybody has, but that's really important from our point of view of understanding what the fire does and being able to try and predict what occurs when we expose larger areas of um, the ceiling, which is pretty much the underside of a floor or, under, or expose walls and they are CLT. Most importantly, I think the part which I think needs to be a lot more work done, and we'll talk about, I'll talk about this a little bit later in this presentation, is the decay period. Um, what it generally shows is that flashover doesn't really change that much. Um, we have typically higher peaks. We get there roughly around the same time. We may have a slightly longer phase of development because obviously we've got more fuel in the space. We've obviously got more timber that can burn. But the decay period that we normally will see in a lot of other compartment um, spaces which are burning where we don't have exposed timber 
um, very different to one where we do have exposed timber. And the issue is, is that when we have longer decays, we're still impacting the structural aspect of the actual building by virtue of the fact that we're getting this longer decay. The last part, most importantly, in some ways as well, is this aspect of char fall off or delamination. And I want to sort of talk about that because that's had a huge influence on all of these fires and in some ways whether um, all of these fires, um, compartment fires and test fires intended to start off to, to determine and show what happened with the lamination, they all did. Um, and sometimes it was interesting that when you look at what the objectives were when people start to write test plans and then what comes out, they're quite different. And part of it is due to this issue of delamination in the CLT. So these are my photos of what happens when we get delamination. This is um, the um, NRC um, and um, SP tests, which were funded by the Fire Protection Research Foundation, and they were carried out at NIST. So sometimes they're called the Fire Protection Research Foundation tests, sometimes they're called the NRC tests, sometimes they're called the NIST tests, and all three of them are kind of correct. So um, this is a test which had an exposed wall on one side. So there was residential fire load in the bottom. Um, we've got a, basically a, a, a small room, um, was fitted out, as I said, as, as a residential apartment. Um, fire has grown, decayed. Um, we are close to two hours into the fire. You can kind of see there's a bit of stuff which is still sort of burning and smoldering away at the bottom, as you'd expect in any fire. That's pretty much most of the fuel load that's left, and a bit of char which is falling off the exposed CLT wall. What happens is that that heat front in there is still moving through the timber. So we have CLT sitting on a wall exposed, a whole lot of it's charred. Um, and then we have still a heat front which is penetrating through that wall because the compartment temperatures are in, I think, roughly four or five hundred degrees at this point Celsius. Um, and there's still radiant heat in that space as well, which is impacting that. And so that char front is still moving through. Delamination or char fall off is an aspect which affects only CLT. And what happens is certain small amounts of the CLT will fall away because the adhesive softens and we don't get a char line which moves and stays all the way through. Um, the CLT with the, with the adhesive line staying in place. And I can explain a little bit more about that in detail if you want. What happens is pieces of the char fall off and timber is protected by the char. So if a piece falls off, basically you're exposing some fresh wood to the actual heat. So that starts to burn. And so what's happened is in the space here, we've got it starting to get the small pieces of char starting to fall off. You start to get ignition. And that's, you can see that sort of 10 minutes later. When you start to get that ignition, you've got fire, you know, basically flames coming up. That's starting to influence the char around it that's starting to fall off. And so what happens is you get more growth. It's sort of, in some ways, self-perpetuating. And so there we are, two hours, 14 minutes. So, you know, 17 minutes later, um, photo 10 minutes after that, that room and that whole wall is basically on fire again. And so the heat release curve has gone up. It's come all the way down to hardly anything. And it sat there for a good 30 minutes, just kind of petering along. Then suddenly it just leapt back up. Highly unpredictable, highly, sort of interesting from the point of view of what's going on um, and really, really an issue that's only related to exposed CLT. So, yeah. because it's truly fascinating. Yeah. Uh, the contents had already burned out. Yes. Okay, so this would be in the phase already that is, is about to self-extinguish or maybe actually had considered being self-extinguished already. Yes, okay. absolutely. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, the best part about these tests was, that, was the, the desire to let them kind of burn out and really the aim was sort of aim for three hours, kind of as a mark and a point where you would expect that there would be nothing left other than maybe a little bit of stuff in the bottom. I mean, at this point, um, you know, this is at NIST, there was a whole lot of safety aspects in place. We were, um, we were allowed to come in here because they were about to put the fire out, realistically. You know, we were, they were within 10 minutes of putting the fire out because everyone had decided it's kind of over, you know, let's <laughs> kind of put it out as we'll go home. Um, and then this happened. And then we all had to kind of rush back out because suddenly the room was on fire again. So, um, you know, this is important, but the reality is it's been repeated in lots of other tests as well. So all those tests I showed you earlier, a lot of them with exposed CLT have had decay periods, and where they've let those go, they've had regrowth. Um, fascinating aspect of the compartment. So the char fall-off aspect is, is adhesive dependent in the CLT, as I said, it's a CLT only issue. Um, and it's been known about for about 10 years. Um, you know, the differences between CLT adhesives and the way that they impacted um, the charring rate through the timber and the way they impacted um, how the timber actually combusted in standard fire tests, and even whether it's a small scale standard fire test or a large scale standard fire test, um, has been known about. We can track that. And we know that it's adhesive dependent. There's been various theories around the fact that it's species dependent on moisture content. Tests again and again show it's very much adhesive dependent. 
And what in the background here is this is a piece of CLT um, which has gone through a two hour, 120 minute fire test, which actually has adhesive which doesn't cause delamination. And so there's a whole lot of adhesives or a number of adhesives which don't cause delamination. And some CLT suppliers use those. And in this case, you can see the line of where the, la the laminations are actually glued together and the char has moved all the way through that. And this is still very much in place, which is what you see with glue lamin or LDL. We see exactly the same process. Um, we see the char moving through and the adhesive stays in place. So, you know, this has become a real issue because we knew about it at standard test, but it impacted the char rate. And so what, you know, we can design around that. Um, but the fact is, it's, it's a real issue when it affects the compartment fire. And um, there's two separate aspects to that. We can predict what happens with CLT delamination and char rates, and we can design around that because in some ways that's a, a pretty predictable and easy to use variable. In a compartment fire, it's, we can't predict when the decay is going to occur. We can't predict how that's going to occur. We can't predict if there's going to be regrowth. Um, it would be really fascinating for somebody to spend more time looking at this. Um, the reality is I'm not actually sure it's actually something which is worthwhile. My view is, and I think there are quite a number of people's views, is that the way that CLT will be manufactured is the fact that there will be two types. There'll be CLT which is manufactured with adhesives which um, cause delamination, and there'll be CLT which is manufactured which doesn't cause delamination. And the reality is, is that if you're building a low medium rise building where you can potentially have, because the codes say you can, you can have buildings which are allowed to burn down, you can kind of have issues where the structure may not have a high level of fire resistance, 30 minutes, maybe only 60 minutes, having CLT which delaminates isn't really an issue. It's not really a problem for you. But if you're in a high rise building where you've got to design for fuller development, you've got to design the fire to have a decay period and understand that, then having it delaminate is a huge issue for you because you can't predict that. We can't rely on formula. There isn't correlations. There's nothing we can sit there and flick into a book and find something. It's not even research out there <coughs> that, that tells us how to do this. And so that's an issue for us. And so the best way to design around that, and the way that we found the best way to design around that for high-rise buildings is, that, is to make sure that we specify CLT, which doesn't delaminate. So part of the reason which we were doing these tests on this um, type of CLT, which was carried out in the US, is we were designing a 12-story building. We were going through the process of getting it approved. Um, we had a certain requirement to have um, a certain amount of the timber exposed. From our point of view, we wanted to make sure that the CLT didn't delaminate. So we carried out a number of tests to prove that it didn't, allowed us to have a predictable method to be able to then show decay because it doesn't have the delamination. So as with any engineering issue, if you can avoid the issue, it makes your life a lot easier, it makes your life a lot simpler if you can just take that variable away. So when it comes to having reliable decay, there's various ways to look at this. One is obviously you protect all the timber and so it doesn't, it's not exposed. Fire a gypsum board on it, that's a nice easy way to get around it. No one really wants that, but it's one way. There's another aspect which we've seen some um, um, engineers and others look at, which is just assume there will be a decay period and the decay will just occur. Now, from my point of view, I think that's a little dangerous. Um, I think there's enough testing out there to show that that's not really predictable, um, but that's for others to look at. Um, another option which has been looked at by a number of researchers, which may have some validity, but it's hard to really tell, is to potentially use a really thick outer lamella. So, you know, there's, a, there's a, an approximate, you know, around 35 to 40 mils, which is the maximum amount of timber you can put on the outside of, of, of a CLT member. And then assume the fact that if you've got a lot of ventilation, you're gonna have a fire which grows relatively quickly, decays relatively quickly, such that potentially your fire will, will have um, the ability to char that timber such that your char won't reach the first glue line. So to me, there's a lot of ifs in that. I, I've looked at, you know, you can potentially, potentially model something like that. Um, I think it's very difficult to be able to to um, have a design which basically allows you to be sure that you're getting the ventilation um, that would allow that to occur. So um, we have real concerns about that um, because just as easy as you can prove it, you can very just as easy disprove it. And as engineers, we wanna make sure that we are having as many solutions as possible, as much sensitivity criteria, which is reasonable, um, but it's hard to be able to, to ensure that we're getting that, especially with the models we currently have, which are in some ways pretty primitive. Um, and as I said, the best option, avoid CLT that delaminates, then you take that issue away. And then we've just got an aspect of exposed solid timber in the same way we would have if we just had glue lamb or LDL or solid timber in place. This whole issue of delamination basically moves away. Um, so, you know, it's an issue, it's an issue for designers everywhere, and it's an issue for, um, for CLT manufacturers as well, because if you imagine we've got 
clients who want to build buildings who are telling us we need to have exposed timber, you've got engineers who want to design this, and I think quite a number of engineers is looking at this and going, actually, we'd rather have CLT, which doesn't delaminate, I don't have to deal with that problem. You know, we want to go to these manufacturers which produce that CLT. And so it's, if you're a CL, CLT manufacturer which doesn't, you probably want to think about you know, where the future of the market is heading, I suppose, and the fact that we're building more taller buildings. So just before we get into some of the details, you know, there's, there's a whole lot of aspects here which I, I suppose, have talked about and, and touched on, but you know, the key thing here is the fact that we have limited amount of correlations and models for exposed timber buildings. Um, we have some, we don't have enough. Um, and we have a real limit in what we can do from a compartment fire analysis. And I will talk a little bit about what we've done internally within ARIP, um, but certainly I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done by people who look at compartment fires, which potentially some of you guys, um, and what happens when we put a bit of combustible um, timber inside of that. Because a lot of this is just basic compartment fire dynamics. We've got a whole lot of really useful correlations. A lot of those were you know, developed in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. You know, BRE did a whole lot of work. There was a whole lot of work done in Japan and certainly in Canada and the US as well, where we came up with all these really good basic correlations. And typically they were in concrete spaces and we burnt wood proofs. Um, you know, there was a whole lot of correlations which were developed out of those. The best part from my point of view is they burnt wood and we're still burning wood now. So a lot of those correlations still stack up. It's just the fact that where the wood is, is actually different. We typically put wood cribs on the floor and measured everything and came up with correlations. Now those kind of wood cribs are maybe on the wall or potentially on the other side of the floor and we've still got that wood crib fuel sitting on the floor. So we try to understand how those correlations we've got currently still, uh, you know, do, do they still work? Um, so items for you guys to think about, if you want to think about some stuff related to timber or just think about some interesting aspects of research, parametric fires. Um, currently, pretty much everyone globally likes to use parametric fires. They're easy, Eurocode have them. Um, they're reasonably validated from the, from the point of view of understanding um, what they can be used for, their approximation. I mean, we see them as a, as a guidance. They're a good way to be able to get a very early read as to where your fire is looking. Um, you can do, put them in a spreadsheet and change the ventilation and get some good outputs from them, change the fuel load relatively easy. Um, we've looked at trying to develop a method whereby we can use these in limited small areas, mainly residential units, which is a good place to start because you've got a whole lot of fire tests going on in residential units as well, um, and how we can potentially use parametric fires. A lot of this is based on assuming that Whatever the, the fuel is on the walls or the ceilings, we're going to assume it's one lump sum sitting on the floor. Um, it's a good approximation. So we actually have all the fuel sitting on the floor, one space. Um, and of course, the parametric uh, model assumes that we've got one compartment fire, burns in one go. Um, we have one, sort of one temperature throughout as well, and we get a time temperature curve out of that. Um, the only way to account for the fuel is actually carry out a literature approach. So we look at the fuel, understand where those linings are, and then account for the, let the fire do its thing. Um, from the point of view of understanding um, the growth and decay, work out a char depth, that gives you a certain amount of fuel, you can put that back in, you need to run the process again and see how it converges. If it doesn't converge, realistically, you've probably got too much fuel. If it does converge, you potentially get something which looks like this. And we've gone through a process of trying to validate this against the existing models we've got out there. And as you can see, some of them are pretty reasonable. I mean, this is the top one is one of the NIST tests where we don't get the right temperatures, but we kind of get roughly kind of the growth and we kind of roughly get a decay. Um, this one is for one of the ICC fire tests in the US. Again, we get temperatures which are slightly higher, which is nice. We kind of get a decay which is relatively in line, um, but then when the decay comes down, we lose this aspect of trying to get, you know, decay where, when we have exposed timber, we get this elongated decay, which we don't pick up in the parametric um, fires at all. So they're a reasonable estimate. They, they're kind of useful from our point of view, but the problem is if you use parametric fires, potentially you're missing out on all this stuff here, which is which is additional charring because all this point here, you know, pretty much above where the compartment timbers is above roughly 200 degrees, we're still getting charring in the timber, which is affecting the structural capacity of the timber. So if your parametric curve does this, but your fire curve does that, then potentially you're not as conservative as you think we are, or as, as we think we are. So that's a real issue. As I said, it's a good place to start. We want to, you know, it's a good place to understand. We've got to understand the limitations of that. We're trying to work out a way that we can start to have longer decays in those. But it'd be great so just to have more people looking at that and start to understand ways to be able to use these. Um, um, you know, Daniel Brandon from SP has basically looked at and published some work on this as well. It was useful having a chat to him and looking at his method and our method. We've got both of them side by side um, and looking at the way that those two methods work. And it's interesting that there is there has been more work um, as a result of his published work as well. Um, Travelling fires, um, you guys are 
very good at things. Um, we expect you guys to have a better understanding than most people. Some of probably like me, knowing Gordon Ramsay had a crooked omelet or something. But um, you know, the reality is that you guys need to understand these and, and tell us whether these will actually work in a compartment where we have them across the ceiling. Um, we've spent a lot of time in Arab discussing these, trying to work out what it would mean and what it would mean to a typical traveling flyer and how this works. Because the reality is we have this methodology work, which we all recognize is very useful from assessing structures and assessing those structures using an open plan office space, which is what we want to be able to assess. Um, if we have an exposed ceiling, which is combustible, um, it can only speed up the fire um, travel speed, and it can only really um, increase the ability for pyrolyzation to occur in the timber, but also the ability for the, the contents to, um, to start to burn as well, because we've got this aspect of our ceiling also um, on fire and radiating down. So um, we've looked at trying to work out how you could potentially change the traveling fire methodology. I don't think we've got too far in that. We're, st we're still talking about it. You know, one of the, the discussions we've also had is that maybe traveling fires just don't work timber spaces you know maybe there actually needs to be a whole separate methodology for large compartment spaces it may not be traveling fires it may be something else um, but we need to work on this because we're going to be pushed to design more and more taller buildings with open plan office spaces with the ceilings and the, and the underside of the clt floors all exposed so this is coming we're designing it now um, we don't have the methods at the moment we've seen various engineers and other um, people at research institutions talk about traveling fires but i think it's very much in its infancy and i don't think actually anybody's actually really seriously looked at it so um you know great place for people to have a look at um as i said decay occurs in a in a, in a much longer process when we have exposed timber um at the moment there's a lot of discussion about self-extinguishment and decay periods where we've got exposed timber um the first place i always like to start off is we actually don't have any definition of what extinguishment means or what decay means other than zero, you know, zero heat release, zero temperature, or get zero above ambient temperature and such. So um, self-extinguishment means very different things to very different researchers. Um, and, and also means very, uh, it's quite different to what I would expect as well. Um, it's really only become an issue with sort of these longer duration tests and the aspect of when we have CLT, which is delaminating, we potentially don't have this decay to self-extinguishment. If we can take out the CLT delamination, potentially we can start to understand what occurs on the way to decay. But then the question is, where do we go to? We've got a line which is going down. Um, as I said, we've got this continued aspect of, um, of the, in some ways, the remains of the compartment still burning, uh, part of its fuel, um, which continues to burn and what the influence is of that on the charring of the timber, which will occur provided we've got, you know, reasonable levels of radiation, reasonable levels of compartment temperature. So I think, you know, this is an issue we still need to work on. We've got lots of assumptions. Um, I'm really, con my biggest concern is in some ways what happens with the stuff which sits at the bottom and continues to smolder and continues to continue to smolder for hours. It may not produce a great temperatures in the compartment, but we've got timber columns which sit in that. And so if you've got this stuff at the bottom, which may be two or 300 mils or so thick, sitting there smoldering away, it's 100, 200, maybe 300 degrees. It's just sitting there and nobody's gonna put it out with a fire hose. What does that mean for the base of our columns? That concerns me. And so, you know, I like to be able to look at designs which architects don't like where we actually put something on the bottom of columns to protect them from the stuff. Because we can predict the compartment temperatures and we can say with a fair amount of ventilation, you know, you're going to lose a whole lot of heat out of that. But the stuff at the bottom, which we see in a lot of these fire tests, that's just going to sit there until somebody puts water on it. So uh, we've got to have a solution for that as well. Um, Speaking of the, 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 the lamination issue, um, one of the main suppliers of um, adhesives for CLT is a company called Henkel, um, and they've just started to um, release a new um, adhesive, which is a polyurethane adhesive. Um, and about 80% of the CLT market use polyurethane adhesives. In some ways, you know, this is getting into the details of the, of the actual products themselves, but there's a whole lot of aspects that we need to understand as engineers about adhesives um, and the way that this product is made. Um, interesting enough, Back in the day when I was at um, university, I did some work on timber adhesives, and then suddenly all the stuff which I had completely forgotten about 20 years ago, I'm suddenly reading and, reading and trying to learn again to understand timber adhesives. Um, because this is important, it's, it's important for us to understand how these adhesives work and how they um, respond to the fire. Um, we've just carried out some small scale tests um, on these are based, these images um, are sort of um, 
two months old, I suppose. Small scale tests and showing again this aspect of where the char has moved through. Um, this was a five ply piece of CLT, moved through the ply lines um, and the char is still in place. This was kind of vertically sitting in the business, so had all the opportunity to fall off. So, so we're starting to see that this adhesive works very well and performs as well as we expect it to and, and prevents um, the char fall off. Residual heating is another aspect which is something which we don't talk about a lot, but we probably need to. Um, there's starting to be a little bit of debate and, and commentary on this. And the fact is, as the temperatures go down, as I said, we're still getting this aspect of charring. The question is, how does that residual heat um, impact columns, beams, walls, ceilings as such? Because we have the compartment temperature, we don't want a whole lot of convective and radiant heat. Um, once that drop um, dies down as such, there's still a radiant line of heat which is moving through the actual timber itself. Um, and then, you know, this is char which has come out of a standard timber, sorry, char which has come out of a, um, and a piece of timber which has come out of a standard fire test. But if you imagine that this char is still at three, four, or 500 degrees, there's still a certain amount of heat which is going to be still pushing into the timber, which has got to go somewhere. I've heard one theory that once um, the, the, the compartment temperature, you know, drops down below about 300 degrees, you get sort of reverse heat transfer and the heat will start to leave the timber and go back to the compartment. I'm not 100% sure that will occur, but it'd be nice for somebody to check and understand that. Um, so, in some ways, this is simple mechanics and simple heat transfer about how this timber can work. And the question for us is really is, you know, once the fire starts to die down, you know, how much continued charring do we get inside the timber because of this residual heat? How much of that is made up of the compartment? How much of that is made up by the fact that the char has a certain amount of heat left? No one's really researched that. No one's really looked at it. So, it'd be useful to know. Connections, I'll just quickly run through these last couple of ones. Um, still not doing, have enough research and enough work on connections, um, which is kind of crazy. We've been doing timber building for a long time. We still don't have enough work on the connections. Um, typically, we find that a lot of the research is on tension connections. Um, we don't use tension in buildings for timber. Um, timber's not that great on tension, and so having tests, which are nice and easy to do in tension, is potentially kind of helpful in certain parts, but often <coughs> not useful because we want to um, either have compression or shear type connectors. The other issue we see is the fact that the connections which everyone wants to use in the industry aren't the ones that are being used from a research point of view. So um, that's a real problem for us because the connectings, connections are often, and the correlations and the work that comes out are very much specific to that connection. But if it's a connection that nobody really wants to use, then unfortunately that research isn't as good as it could be. Um, the main issue here is the fact that you know timber doesn't take a lot of temperature to start reducing its strength. You can sort of you know have a look at the Eurocode or just have a look at most um, um, mechanics and of um, properties um, textbooks, and you'll see that timber from a tension, compression, um, modulus, e elasticity, they all drop off pretty quickly once you get over sort of 100 degrees Celsius. Um, so if we're losing strength at instead of you know, steel like 500 or 550 or 600 degrees Celsius, but we're losing strength at 150, 200 degrees. You've got to recognise that you know it doesn't take much from a fire growth point of view to actually start to lose the strength in these sort of connections. So um, you know the ability to have connections which are strong to members that are surrounding it is really important, especially from a fire resistance point of view as well. Um, again, we don't have great correlations on this sort of stuff. One more item: um, we have a lot of buildings where we have steel hybrid sections, typically um, steel is with intermittent paint, we put CLTs on floors on the top, really nice efficient solution, we have the benefits of steel on the long span so you don't have so many columns, you get the timber as well, um, everybody likes this. Um, the reality is though that we have the situation where we have CLTs sitting on the top of a steel beam. The steel beam, if it's exposed to a fire, the CLT is exposed to a fire, the intermittent works, does its magic and protects the steel section. But it keeps the steel section at around you know, 400, 450 to 500 degrees. But you've got CLT members sitting on top of that. It's not exposed to um, the heat of the fire directly. It's basically exposed to the fire through conduction through that steel member. Now there's a view that, what, you know, there's, there's a couple of views about what will happen to that CLT. Some have said that it won't char as much as it compared to a piece of CLT which is sitting next to it, which is exposed to the fire and there's a whole lot of convective and radiative aspects of that. There's another view that it actually may um, um, weaken a lot quicker because of that process of conduction through the timber. Um, and the fact that there's a whole lot of load on it as well. Um, so simple things like this that we are still thinking about. We can have engineered solutions for this, but they're probably very conservative. And we have some engineered solutions which are, I think, very conservative. Mainly because we just don't have 
bite test information, the research, and the basic aspects of looking at the thermal mechanics of this to actually understand it. So, a couple of conclusions. Um, you know, we've got a whole lot of fire testing on residential units. We've got a lot of work on residential units, actually, um, with all the fire tests, which is really useful for us. Um, and so when it comes to residential buildings, medium and high rise, we've got a really good database that we can use and understand. Um, you know, from our point of view, we would like to limit the amount of surfaces which are exposed, and we typically work with architects to be able to do that. And we typically will always choose and want to use delaminating CRT because we want to have a predictable outcome, and it's you know, important from an engineering point of view. Um, large open plan offices, we're starting to try and be pushed on a lot of those. Um, a lot of the engineering community is with a lot of exposed timber. I think the modelling for that is, is probably a little, you know, quite a bit out there. Um, we've got some idea of what we can do. I think when we model these, we could be completely right and we could be completely, completely wrong. It really is that sort of model at the moment. We really are a long way from probably where we need to be. Um, and partly it's driven by the fact we don't have a lot of large scale testing. It's pretty hard to scale up a residential um, unit of 90 square metres and assume that that's an office floor of 2,000 square metres. Um, that's a big jump. Um, and so we've got to be careful about what we do. So, you know, from my point of view, when we engineer, we need to be engineering based on good solid data. We need to be able to engineer based on facts and tests and, and the information that's in front of us and research. And I think what I've seen is we are taking, you know, research at universities and using it pretty quickly. Um, the connection between someone carrying out research and us using it and building is as fast as I've ever seen. And in some ways, people are still carrying out PhDs and they're looking at their research and going, how can we use that? So from that point of view, it's really interesting times and the connection between people doing research industry and actually getting things built is actually you know, fascinating in some ways, but we don't see that in a lot of industries. So again, thanks for your time. Um, that's all from me. Happy to go through some of those items, talk a little bit more about it, um, but thanks for, stop, thanks for letting me stop in and um, great to uh, be here.